God and Adam were walking through the Garden of Eden, discussing various things. At one point, Adam says, wow, God, you sure made Eve awfully beautiful, just amazingly beautiful. The Lord, the Lord said, yes, my son, that is so you would love her very, very deeply. And after a brief moment, Adam hesitantly commented, but Lord, you made Eve not too smart. Ah, yes, said God. That's so she would love you very, very deeply. <laughs> Listen, don't, don't, don't send me no emails. I, I, it's a joke. Turn to someone and say, it's a joke. All right, so we're in a, we're in a series that we've entitled A Fuller House. Say A Fuller House. And it's based on John 10.10, 10, which says, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. He said, but Jesus said, but I've come that they may have life and that life, help me out somebody, to the full, to the full, full, or a better life. Amen? And and, and so the New Living Translation says it this way. It says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and, help me out, and satisfying life. A rich life. And satisfying life. How many of you know the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, things have just gotten a little bit better for you? Amen? Amen. Things have, you, you have just moved on to a place where things can improve greatly. And, and that's the heart of the Father. He wants to give us, he's, he's telling us there's, there's, a, there's a malevolent spirit out there. You can just turn on the news and see what he's about. He's about stealing and killing and destroying. He said, but, the, but I sent my son so that he could come into this humanity and that he can give to people a rich and satisfying, a fuller life. And one of the ways that the Father tries to give a rich and satisfying life is through his word and through the things he's ordained, especially through marriage. The title of this morning's message is Why Marriage and Making It Work. Why Marriage and Making It Work. Now, I ask that question today because how many know that marriage gets a bad rap today? It gets a bad rap. And and because it gets a bad rap, there's a lot of folks who are just opting out of it. But marriage is not just a good idea. It's a God idea. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said it was not good for man to be alone. He says, I will make a helper suitable for him. And you know the story. He he couldn't find a suitable helpmate, so God laid him down and and put him to sleep. And from his side, he took a rib. And from that rib, the Bible says he formed a woman. Then he woke up the man. And when the man looked at the woman, he said, whoa, man, this is awesome. You are now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. It was instant love the moment he saw her. And, 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 and And so... God, the Bible says, created Adam and Eve. He made them male and female. He created them. And then he commanded them to be fruitful and to multiply. He created them male and female. And he commanded them to be fruitful and to multiply. Now, can I just say that? Being fruitful and multiplying ain't going to happen without an Adam and an Eve and a male and a female. Just saying. And so, it's no wonder that the thief is targeted. And that's just one of many ways that he's gone after the institution of marriage from the very beginning, what God has set up. But it's no wonder he's targeted and successfully attacked it, this institution, and he he tries to throw at it all sorts of nonsense to try to devastate it uh, and, and to undermine what God's original purpose was. Let me just throw out some statistics to you. $112 $112 billion a year. That's what it costs taxpayers a year due to divorce and, and the caring of unwed mothers. Another statistic is only 2%, say only 2%. That's the percentage of people who end up in poverty if, if, they, gra- if they graduate from high school, work at a full-time job, and postpone marriage and childbearing until age 21. Now, let me say it again in case you didn't understand what I said. If you graduate from high school, listen to me, young people, work a full-time job and postpone marriage and childbearing until after you're 21 years old, your chances of being in poverty are only 2%. If you don't do all those three, your chances of of living in poverty raise to, drum roll, please, 
The Brookings Institute says that if we, if we had marriage rate today that we had in 1970, there would be a 25% drop in poverty. The Heritage Foundation says that, marriage, that, says that marriage drops the probability of children living in poverty by 82%. Marriage is getting slammed, and the end result is people are living in poverty. And so the decline of marriage is complex and it's multifaceted. High divorce rates... Increased cohabitation. People are just deciding, I'm not getting married. I'm going to live together. There's a skyrocketing number of outer wedlock births, something like 40% today in America. The use of contraceptives and abortions, believe it or not, and the removal of the stigma associated with those outer wedlock marriages. You know those shotgun weddings we used to hear about? When, if someone got someone pregnant, it was understood that you were going to marry this person, that's gone. That's gone. And so now, in the past, you'd get a girl pregnant, you would marry them. Now the expectation is, if that girl got pregnant, the guy expects the girl to go get an abortion. That's what happens. And if she won't get an abortion, he, he doesn't feel obligated to take, take responsibility of that child. He now says, that's your, that's your responsibility. That's your problem and he walks away. Now all of these have all contributed to the drop in the marriage rate because in our culture it's no longer elevated or celebrated. In fact, it's denigrated. But say what you want. All the overwhelming research about marriage shows that marriage brings greater financial stability to families. And we're talking about how to have a fuller life or better families, better relationships. I'm telling you, you are going to elevate the institution of marriage. And you're going to start to reject what the culture is telling you and the, no the cultural norms. Because what they're telling you is not going to lead to a better place for you in the long run. Am I talking to anyone out there? Amen. And single motherhood is the leading cause of poverty for both women and children. In fact, a few years ago, the New York mayor at, at the time, Michael Bloomberg, Human Resource Commissioner, uh, his Human Resource Commissioner Robert Doerr was re reported to be planning a campaign to promote marriage for the, this is what he says, the outcome of the child. And you asked, they asked him why he was doing that. He said, because 70% of all the babies that were born in the Bronx at the time were born to unwed mothers. A lot of them were teenagers with no expectation of that father to take care of that child. And so they grew up in in, in, in poverty. So why marriage? In 1970, 79% of the U.S. adults were married. Now, only 52%. What has been the backlash of the decrease in the marriage? Well, guess what? We've got a whole lot of troubled kids out there today. We've got a whole lot of kids who are, who are you know, suffering from anxiety and depression and the doing things to, to hurt themselves because there's not the two people in the family anymore, and, and they've been the byproducts of it. At the same time, you've got all these you know, kids who, who they're pumping up with medication. At the same time, the, 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 the facts are staggering. Almost all the prisoners are, are from single-parent homes, almost all of them, single-parent or broken homes. Now, that doesn't mean that if, if that's your reality, like it's been my reality, that you're going to end up in prison somewhere, somewhere. It doesn't mean that at all, especially if you get a hold of Jesus in your life. Come on, somebody. Especially if you get a hold of the message of the, the, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus says, I've come that you might have life. He said that even though your parents may, may not have had it all together, your heavenly Father's got it all together. Amen? And he's got a plan and a purpose for your life that if you will latch on to that, you can change the direction of whatever is going on in your family tree. Amen. The Bible says curse is everyone who, hung on, who hangs on a tree. Because some people feel like they're just living out a curse. And, and, and the truth is it becomes a cyclical curse because those kids grow up and, they, and they're being raised in a dysfunctional situation. They're being raised by every time they can hurry or maybe somebody else in the family and they're hurt and they're broken and, and at some point they become adults and they start having babies and now because they don't have the wherewithal to, to raise a child in, in the way it should be, they're now raising the next generation. But the Bible says, and it feels like a curse, but the Bible says, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree, and Jesus hung on a tree for every single one of us. Amen? Amen. 
So we don't have to walk that out in our lives. We don't have to experience those things in our lives as well if we would come to Jesus. But the truth of the matter is that's what's taking place. That's what's going on in our prisons. That's what's going on in our psych hospitals. That's what's going on with our children today. That's what's happening in our population. We are now raising a generation which does not know what a healthy marriage looks like, feels like, and therefore it cannot be modeled to them. And when I say modeling, I'm talking about a good marriage or in a good relationship. We're not talking about perfection. There's nothing perfect out there. No one is perfect. I'm talking about just in a, in a, healthy, in a healthy marriage where, where you're modeling how to, to, to walk in forgiveness or to have self-discipline or to show some restraint from impulses or to exercise, you know, uh, uh, self-control or, 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 or to seek reconciliation. All of that is shot because they don't see it. They've never seen it. And you add to that the culture that says, you know, they look at the, all these models, the, the celebrities, and they seem to have it all together. And the one thing they have going for them is a lot of them they like to ad- adopt, which is great. But, but, but they don't like to get married. How, how long does a celebrity uh, marriage usually last? Come on, somebody. Help me out. How, how long do they usually last? I say about six minutes. You know, you get this big pomp and circumstance, you know, like, right, like, like we just saw on the news uh, on Sunday. Who saw the royal wedding on the news? Right? I just woke up, flipped on the thing. I said, oh, look, look, I'm not seeing this wedding. And you, and, you get, and, you, and you see this big, you know, everything, the train, and everybody's invited, and who's, who's there, and who's what's there, and who's this there. And before, before the ink dries on the, on the marriage certificate, you see in the newspaper that someone's filing for divorce. That's the celebrity weddings today. And that's what the kids are looking at. Now, the problem with, with looking at them as, uh, uh, as people to be, you know, aspired to, the, the, they, they have millions and millions of dollars. So they can have your nannies and they, they can have someone come clean their house and they can have somebody drive their kids to school even when their marriages fall apart. How many of you know, know that that's not true of most of us? Come on, somebody. Most of us are living paycheck to paycheck. And so when we decide we're going to be like them and just not get married, and then we're going to push out all these children, 77% of the people who cannot afford what they're doing end up in poverty. That's the reality for most of the world. And so with 52% of all marriages going down in flames, I think as a culture we have problems. I think as a culture, there's something going on that needs to be addressed, and we cannot just keep doing business as usual and just allowing, allowing this slippery slope to go down because, again, it becomes cyclical. At some point, those kids who are being raised in that situation grow up, and because they don't have a healthy thing to look at, they just start doing the same, repeating the same cycle over and over again. When my kids were small, and now my grandkids, Every now and then we'd have a shower and somebody would bless us or my, or my family with a, with a stroller. I remember the last one was Eric with, with, our, with our grandkids or even Ricky. And, and, and oftentimes, what do men do when you get all this stuff in a box and, and you see all these things? What, what do we do? What do we want to do? We just immediately want to start putting the things together, right? All right? Don't even worry about the instructions. I, I can look at that. Just, just show me the picture and then I will put it together, right? Well, you know, 40 minutes into this thing, and things aren't quite rolling the way they should and snapping the way they should and doing what it should be, me and Eric decide, let's get the instruction manual. (laughs) And once we got the instruction manual out and, and looked at how it was supposed to be done in the sequence it was supposed to be done, guess what happened? It was done. It was done. And it was done correctly. Come on, somebody. Now, folks, sometimes it takes a little longer to do things correctly and to follow the manufacturer's intended thing, but you'll get it right if you do it the way the manufacturer says to do it. Amen? Amen. I'm talking to someone out there today. Because marriage was not the world's idea. Marriage was God's idea. And if God instituted marriage, you know what? He knows how it works best. He knows why it works and how it works. And he expects us that if you want to know how, why it works and how it works, to look to the manual, which is the word of God, and to allow him to instruct you on the role that you need to play so that it could work best in your life and in the life of the family around you. Does that make sense? 
And you won't just have success 50% of the time or 52% of the time. When we start doing things God's way, we will have success 100% of the time. I, I, I promise you. How many know God never gets it wrong? God never gets it wrong. And so if I can just figure out, okay, Lord, let me just get on the same page as you, I'm, my, my rate of, uh, of success is going to go up dramatically when I stop insisting on doing things my way or picking, taking my cues from the culture, which don't care, which I think is run by the, the God of this world, liturgy, and he's just trying to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he's trying to do in every area, especially this, the area of marriage. So if you're here today and you may be married or you may be single or single again or you may be happily married or a marriage that could use some work, I implore you for the next few minutes and over this series to listen. Even again, if your marriage is rocking, how many know that even if things are good, things could get better, amen? amen? And so that's what we're going to be talking about, how things could get better. On your outline, there should be a place we're called a reality check. And the reality check, under that, your first villain says, all marriages have its challenges. Can, I, can we just get that out of the way? All marriages have its challenges. There are people who will look at, at, at relationship and say, they've got it going on. They, they've married the perfect person. She, they married the perfect individual, and they don't have any issues. Listen, all marriages have its issues because you have two imperfect people coming together to form a oneness. How many you know that that ain't easy? That when I come into a relationship and I've got my baggage and she comes into a relationship and she has her baggage, that, that the Bible says, and the two of you shall become one. <laughs> and, and, and what you've gone is now, now you've got two sets of, of baggages that you have to deal with. Come on, somebody. Everybody that knows, knows. Come on. Everyone that's been married knows, all right? Because you were you just thinking, it's just me. I can't figure this out. How come I can't make this work? Oh, why is it so difficult? No, it's because you got two broken people trying to work things out. And so given that, Paul's advice to us, quite frankly, was he says, in his opinion, in his opinion, he says, I think everybody should just stay single. Uh-oh. This way, he says, you can devote your life exclusively to the service of the Lord. But he recognizes that that's easier said than done. Now, let me just say this. Where are my single folks out there? Oh, let, me just, let me just say this. Let me just say this right now, okay? Because... You are also single if there's no ring on your finger. All right, when I say ring, I'm talking about wedding ring. I'm not talking about promise ring, <laughs> engagement ring. What is that? He's the love of my life. What did he give you? He gave me a promise ring. <laughs> when did he give it to you? Eight years ago. <laughs> oh, okay. And you're living like you're married now, huh? You, well, he said he gave me a promise eight years ago. If he hasn't married you, she hasn't married you, you are still single. Okay? And so, Paul has a lot to say about marriage and singleness. And a lot of people are of the opinion that you cannot fulfill God's purposes for your life unless you're married. That's a lie. Jesus wasn't married. Paul wasn't married. They all got it done. Amen? Amen? And so you don't have to be married to get to where God wants you to be. In fact, this time of singleness, and we're going to be talking about that in this series, is the time when God wants you to start working on your, your relationship with him so that you can become the man and woman of God he's called you to be. Because it's better for you to start working out some of those issues before you go into a relationship with someone else with a lot of issues. What? Come on, somebody. <laughs> to minimize that. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's getting quiet in here. Oh, my goodness. I'm... All right, so, so Paul tells us, this is what he says in, 1 Corinthians 7, 32. He says, I would, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. 
how he can please the Lord. <laughs> but, a man, but, a man who's con- but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. He goes on to say, an unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. In other words, she ain't in the clubs. She ain't out there playing the field. Come on, somebody. He's saying that a Christian, any Christians in the house? Anyone not the same say they follow Jesus? Anyone say they love Jesus? You want Jesus? You know? If you're not married, he said, in his opinion, you don't have no one else to worry about except the Lord's affairs what God is trying to do in you and through you. He goes on to say, her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body, someone say body, Body. and spirit. Someone say spirit. Spirit. Both of them matter. Come on, somebody. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, and he tells you how, how she can please her husband. And he goes on to say, and I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a, Help me? Right way. And then he explains what he means by right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So Paul is saying that there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. And when he defines the right way to live, he defines it as someone who is living in an undivided devotion to Jesus. Again, they're not out in the clubs and they're not out playing the fields. I'm single, I'm a Christian, but you're jumping from this to that, to this, to that. No, he's talking about your devotion to the Lord. And whether you're married or not, that should be, the, that we should have, we should try to keep a, a devotion to God, amen? amen? And he just thought being married was a little bit more difficult. He thought being married would impede that because you're not just worried about the affairs of the Lord, you're also worried about your husband, your wife, your children, making ends meet and all these other things. And he thought, he saw that as dividing your devotions. But he concedes that it's not good for men to be alone. And he talks about this thing of being gifted, a gifted singleness or gifted for marriage. This is, listen to what he says. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, he says, I wish everyone could get along without marrying, just as I do, but we are not all the same. Thank God. God gives some, God gives some the gift of marriage, and to others he gives the gift of singleness. So both of them are gifts. Amen? He says, now I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am, Watch, watch. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. Listen, listen. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. And so he says to the single person, if you have control, and we'll talk about this further in the series, self-control, and you can stay in undivided devotion to the Lord, do that. Because the moment you accept someone else into your life, you're also not only going to have to please God, you're going to have to spend some time pleasing them as well. He said, now, but if you're a single person, and he says, and you have the ability to, to, to stay single, but every time you see that young filly walk by you, <laughs> something raises up inside of you. Come on, somebody. You, you, your face gets flustered, or you see that guy, and he's just like, oh, my goodness, you know, there's, there's something burning inside of you. He says, listen. It's better to marry, not shack up, not play the fields, not turn to pornography. Come on, somebody. It's getting quiet in here. (laughs) He says it's better to marry than to burn with lust. God's plan for us in that area was marriage, it was always marriage. It hasn't changed. It hasn't diverted. The Bible talks about drinking from your own well. And don't go to other people's wells and speaking of adultery, find that person that God has for you. Now, when I say that person, there's a lot of people that say, there's only one person. Mm. Can I just say I don't believe that? 
I believe the moment you say, I do, and you've made promises before God and the people in front of you, then that's the one person. But until you get there, I think God gives you a choice. And that choice, in that choice, God could, you could say yes or no. And that's why I said it's important to work things out while you're single. Because a lot of people are thinking, once I get married, that person's going to complete me. <laughs> and then everything's going to get better. And you stop working on your stuff. And I promise you, that person will be able to meet some needs. He ain't going to be able to meet all your needs. And if you go into the relationship thinking that that person is going to meet all your needs, you're heading for a divorce court. Can, can I just say that again? Because that person cannot meet your spiritual needs. We're going to talk about that. Only God can meet some of your needs, a lot of those needs. And so you need to get this relationship right with God so that when God brings these people in as a choice and he presents them to you, you are also presentable or acceptable to them as well. It's getting real quiet in here. And allow God to work out your stuff so that when you do come together, it's not the war of the roses. <laughs> it's not... Rick, how many know that everybody gets together and, they, and when they look at each other, I call them rose colored glasses. You know what rose colored glasses are, right? Everything is just, <laughs> this person's the greatest thing since peanut butter. This person, he, 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 what's that Disney song? He finishes my sentence, sandwiches, sentences. You, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, he was the worst one for her, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Anyone seen that Disney show? <laughs> finishes my sandwiches. Anyway, and we look through these rose-colored glasses and we're like, oh, this is awesome. Yes, yes, get, get, to, get to the altar. Dom, 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 dom. Do you? Do you tell me to, until death do you? I do, I do. And then the glasses come off. The dude won't the toilet seat down. <laughs> you're getting up in the middle of the night, you're falling through into the toilet. <laughs> he don't have no sense with the toothpaste. What is the deal with all that shaving? Can't he clean up after himself? Why is that stuff always laying? What is this thing hanging on? The, la the ladies, what is that thing hanging on, on the shower thing? Why do I have to look at that when I get out? Of Come on, somebody. Where's my meal? Turn to somebody, look at them and say, work your stuff out. <laughs> I, I believe that the gift of singleness is a special calling. And I do believe that God wants us to work on our single. Because before you're married, you're single. And I promise you, finding that one is not going to you know, somehow magically make you complete so that you can fulfill God's plan for your life. It's not, it's not, it's not going to happen that way. It will be a gift. While you're single, work on your stuff so that when you get into that relationship, <laughs> things will go better because we don't have that many things to have to deal with. But having said that, I don't think most people have the gift of singleness. I just don't. And the instruction of the word is, if you don't have that self-control, this is not the time to be playing the field. He says, find a wife. Find a husband. It's better to marry. To marry. Not shack up. Not live together. Not give the promise ring for six or eight years. <laughs> than to burn. I know nothing I'm saying is culturally correct. I'm just saying that. I know, I know that's what's going on in the culture. I know it's going on in the church because the, the culture has seeped into the church. And then I've got a responsibility before God 
to teach you what the Bible says. Not what I think. Listen, I'll give you the scriptures. You can check it out for yourself. Don't, don't go by what I, don't check your brain at the door. Those papers I give you, that's the scriptural references. Go back and check them. I don't believe that most of us have it. And so, we talk about what God expects us to do or how to act in the role of a single, and we talk about how he expects us to act in the role of the married. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, this is what he says. He says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. The one. I'm waiting for the one. No. He says she can marry whoever she wishes. There's one stipulation. Help me out, somebody. Only if he loves the Lord. <laughs> People who come to my office, you know, they want counseling. They want marriage counseling or premarital counseling. That's great. Pastor Rick, I met the one. You did. That's awesome. <laughs> Tell me about him. Well, you got these. He's so tall and he's so handsome. He, he wears boots. He's got green eyes. He's, and, 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 and he, you know, you know, they go on and on. He looks good in jeans. Okay. Okay, slow down. You're a Christian, right? Yes. Does he love Jesus? I'm working on that, Pastor Rick. <laughs> he came one time to your church with me. Oh, when was that? Easter. <laughs> Did he come back? Well, I'm working on it. And this is the one, huh? <laughs> Did you ask him if he loves Jesus? Yes. What did he say? I, yeah, he said, sure, sure, I love Jesus, sure. Okay. Ladies, he said, you can marry anyone you want. The only stipulation he put on there. And I, that's the first thing I ask. Does she, know, does she know the Lord? Does she love Jesus? Are you coming to me for, for a blessing from your pastor? Because I promise you you're not going to get one if the answer is no. I'm not going against what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what fellowship does light have with darkness? What fellowship does God have with Bethel, which is another word for the devil? If that person is not living and loving Jesus, you should not be with him. Yeah. Now, having said that, obviously, you come to faith the way... Let me clarify this because somebody just... I just felt it in my spirit. Pastor Rick gave me permission to divorce my heathen husband. No, I didn't. <laughs> no... I didn't. Because <laughs> the Bible says, speaks to that too. It says, because people come to the Lord however they come, okay? And sometimes you married and you, no one was saved and then you got saved and he's still not saved. And the Bible speaks to that as well. He says, I want you to win them over by, by the way you act toward them. Not by nagging them or not by doing all things, but by, what's this, what are we talking about? A gentle and quiet spirit. That's what, and, and, and you show forth the love of Jesus. He said, because you might have, now you have the ability to win them. And if they're willing to stay with you, the Bible says, you must, listen, you must stay with him. Now, if he decides you know what, uh, this is not who I married. And he decides, you know, I'm, I married you when you weren't, weren't a believer in Jesus and I don't like what's going on in your life and I'm going to leave. The Bible says, then you let him go. Better to be at peace, all right? But it doesn't ever, nowhere does it say you have the right to walk out because he's not a believer or she's not a believer. I just wanted to clarify that, Okay. Somebody, someone's going to take that clip and it's going to go viral and pastor in Fort Lauderdale gives everyone permission to bounce. <sighs> but he goes on to say, but in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And he gives the reasons why. And I think I was giving you counsel from God's spirit when I said this. So Paul's advice comes to us because in his heart of hearts, his stated goal is that 
he believes it's ideal, it's ideal for all of us to live an undivided devotion toward the Father. And having to please another person in your life or to raise a family would challenge that. But he acknowledges that sinfulness is a gift. And he, and he flat out says it's better to marry than to burn with lust. And so with that, there's some roles that we, ought to, that, we, that we all need to know concerning marriage. Number one is, if you're going to get married and things are going to work out for you, there must be mutual submission. Mutual submission. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Is that what it says? In other words, out of love for Jesus. And so Jesus has to be that top, the top dog in your relationship. It's not on your outline, but write, this, write somewhere on your outline. Go ahead and draw a little triangle like that. You got a little triangle? Okay, anyone see that? It's a triangle. Okay, and on the bottom I want you to write your name here, and then your spouse or your would-be spouse there. Even the single ones, I want you to pay attention because it's going to help you. And then at the top of that triangle, I want you to write God or the Father God. Okay? And so, if God is not in the picture and it's just you two, he will never be God for you and you will never be God for that person. In fact, you're going to look to them to meet all your, your needs and then you're just going to get disappointed and you're going to get frustrated because they can't meet all your needs, all your brokenness, all the things that was done or not done to you. They can't. Every single person, the marriage was God's idea and he never intended us to work it out without him. So we need God in that relationship. And so as we get closer to God, what happens to our relationship with each other? Come on, somebody, help me out. We get closer to each other. The Bible talks about a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. That third strand is the presence of God in your life, amen? If you want your relationships to be better, stop excluding God. Allow him to be a part of your lives. R refer to the manual rather than trying to figure it out yourself, or worse, taking your cues from the culture. Now, when those kids start coming, where do those kids go? Right in the middle of a stable, sane, and spiritual relationship. You take God out, mm, what happens to the kids is, is whatever happens to the kids. Does that make sense? So we want to keep God in the, in the picture. And when it says submit to one another out of reverence to Christ, that word, that word means yield or agree or defer to. What is God asking us to yield or agree or defer to? He's asking us to yield to our Christian roles as a husband and as a wife. In Ephesians 5.22, it gives us what these roles are. Listen. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, speaking of Jesus, the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her, to make her holy and clean, washing, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorified church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to, help me out someone, love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself because the two of you become one. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And so Paul is saying that 
the marriage between a husband and wife is an earthly picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. It's, it's a representation. And just like Father God used Christ to perfect the church, God will use marriage, listen to me, to perfect and to mature us into, listen, 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 loving, compassionate, kind, forgiving, and patient men and women, husbands and wives. That's what he's called us to be. Now the question is, how does he do that? <laughs> he does that because he gives you ample opportunities to be loving, to be kind. And, and, and anybody got any children in here today? Come on, somebody. To be patient, to be forgiving. Come on, somebody. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is, is, is all these things. And he wants to see the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Certainly he wants you to enact it in the world, but I promise you the microcosm of where it's worked out is in your home. Your wife needs to see a patient husband. Your children need to see a forgiving father. Come on, somebody. Your, 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 the people in your family need to see, instead of harshness and brutality, they need to see kindness and patience and love. Someone, was, someone told me one time, he says, loving someone is never having to say you're sorry. I'm like, what? I mean, I get the concept. But since I've been married, I've had to say I'm sorry a bunch of times. <laughs> Somebody. And it's, and I'm married 30 years, over 30 years. If it's going to work out, your relationship is going to work out, we're going to walk in kindness and forgiveness and grace and mercy toward everyone in that house. And we're going to deal with each other's imperfections because no one is perfect. Amen. And that's how you're going to have a fuller house or a fuller experience. God expects us to submit to one another out of reverence to him. And the way we do that is by allowing his spirit to, to, to have preeminence in our relationship to each other so that we can give the grace and we can model the grace that everybody desperately needs. Because the truth is we're fallen people. And apart from God's grace, none of us can stay in relationship. The moment sin came into the world, how many, how many of you know that that same Adam and Eve who, who, who God took from his rib, the woman, and he woke up and he declared, whoa, man, you are now flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. You know, he, he declared this wonderful thing over her, but the moment sin entered into the world, we know what happened. The blame game started. When God confronted him, he said, what have you done? It was a woman whom you gave me. And the woman says, it was Satan who deceived me. And so on and so on. So he went from saying, whoa, man, to whoa, W-E, W-O-E, man, to the woman. And so the first thing God did in dealing with the sin that had taken place they tried to cover their own sin. You remember that? They were hiding from God, and they took fig leaves, and leaves just fall apart. How many of you know leaves are never a good covering? But when God dealt with the sin in their lives, what he gave them, do you remember what he gave them? He gave them skin or fur. Sorry, all you Peter people out there. God was the first one <laughs> to take a sacrifice. And he took that sacrifice and he gave them fur to cover, them, to cover up their nakedness. How many of you know without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins? Come on, somebody. And so we see that type and shadow from the very beginning. From the very beginning in the garden when God, created, when God performed the first sacrifice so that people could be covered for the sins that are in their lives. And, and, and God covers the sin. And we need to understand that. God has that covering for us so we don't have to ourselves. Now, I say this, and I say this with deference. 
Because a lot of times we get into our relationships and we want to work things out ourselves and we demand, we, we, we set aside this whole mutual submission thing and we try to say, no, it's going to be my way or the highway and you're going to do what I say or whatever and then you, and this one gets their back up and this one gets their back up and before you know it, that relationship where you stood at the aisle and you said, I love you, I love you too, I'm going to be with you forever, I'm going to be with you forever, all of a sudden it becomes the war of the roses and, 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 and we're not experiencing, you know, the, the blood of forgiveness forgiveness that Jesus is, that offers on the cross, we're trying to draw each other's blood, figuratively speaking, okay? And so, and so God is saying, listen, I've already done all this stuff. I've covered their faults. I've covered their shortcomings. I've covered everything. I've done it all on the cross. And all you guys need to do is to, is to submit yourself to what I say and how I'm telling you how things are going to work, and things will work better. Does that make sense? And so Paul simplifies the process for every single one of us because he, God is telling us to put down our weapons and put down our swords. Jesus has done it all for us. And this is what he says. This is what he says. He simplifies it even for those who are uber dull like myself because I know if I didn't get a hold of the word of God, can I just say this? My wife and I come from a family. Deb, Deb has five siblings. I have two others, so there's three of us. Every single person in our family are divorced, except for us. Now, why would we be the exception? Because we, she came from the same womb as her siblings, and I come from the same womb as mine. What's the difference? I promise you the only difference is Jesus. That's what it is. I promise you that we got to the place where, where because we've had our frictions, I promise you. And we could have gone to that same place that everybody else has gone, but instead we, we went to Jesus with it, and we laid down our swords, and we allowed God to take preeminence in our lives. I'm talking to someone out there. And so Paul simplifies it for us. This is what he says. He says, really, really, husbands, you only have to remember one thing. And wives, you only have to remember one thing. And this is what I want you to remember. He says, we must have love and respect for each other. And Ephesians 5.33 puts it this way. So again, I say, each man must, help me, love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife, help me, must respect her husband. I can remember one thing. I may not be able to remember 10 things, but I can remember one thing. Husbands love your wives. And he tells us how as Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? Help me out. How did he love the church? He died for the church. He gave it all for the church. That's part of the frustration from the ladies. I, I die for my wife. I do all this for my wife. And then she said, but he won't even take out the garbage. He won't even do the dishes. He can't even pick up the kids without complaining. His socks are all over the floor. Guys, come on. We can do better, amen? The example we have been given is Jesus himself. And Jesus, when it came to his bride laid it all down. He looked at her and he says, you are to die for the moment he accepted her as his bride. Now to the wife, he says, you must respect your husband. And then he tells you how to do it. He says, do it as unto the Lord. I respect him when he earns my respect. That's your problem. Because you think he has to earn it. He doesn't. That's like him saying, I love you when you earn my love. Mm. See how bad that sounds? It's the same thing. He has to love you as unto the Lord. 
It's commanded by the scripture. And the Bible, you, you want to lose a guy? Start disrespecting him in front of his family, in front of his friends. Start doing all that mess. It's received as not being loving. Can I just help you out, ladies? Can, we, can, can I just tell you the truth? I know it's getting real quiet in here. And so Paul says it's a great mystery. I'm going to sum it up in just two words. Men, you got one role. This is it. This is it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Love your wives. Oh, you don't know what that means? Look at Jesus. He gave up his life for them. And to the wives, he said, respect your husbands. How can you respect them when he acts like a knucklehead and he doesn't do right? Don't just respect him as the person. Respect his position. Do it as unto the Lord. Anybody have any respect for Jesus? Would you cuss Jesus out? Would you give him a piece of your mind? Men, would you raise your hands to Jesus? Come on, somebody. You do it as unto the Lord, mutual submission. We're out of time. If you want to get the rest of this message, you're going to have to come back next week. All right? Amen? And so as we come to close this morning, I want to give you an opportunity. If you're here today and you've not yet accepted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, listen to me. It will be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer of commitment to him. Young people, almost done. Shh. It's probably the most important part because this is where I get an opportunity to just introduce people to Jesus. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, but I've come that you might have life and that life to the fullest. Everything works better when we do it Jesus' way. I'm just saying. I am just saying. And so when we learn to submit to Jesus, things will get better in our marriage, in our relationships, in every other area of our lives. Let him, and don't take our cues from the culture. I promise you, it's just going to mess you up. But the number one thing to do is your personal relationship with Jesus. Even for my single people. Where are my single ladies? Oh, all the single ladies. Single fellas. Your number one thing we could be doing is our personal relationship with Jesus. And Jesus says he loves you. Well, I mean, just quote scripture. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, Jesus. That if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life. And believe means put your faith in. Trust that what he did on the cross, he did it for you. That same covering that we see in the garden where God says, you know, fig leaves ain't going to cover it. Something has to die. And they, something died and he gave them the clothes. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That if you haven't repented and put your trust in Jesus Christ, your sins are not forgiven. And so God, out of love, gave his son, say, listen, I want relationship with you so that we can have relationship. I sent my son to die in your place. Why do you have to die? Because sin cannot be in the presence of God. And all of us have sinned. I sinned. You've sinned. We've all sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And the Bible says what we deserve, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord if I place my trust in him for the forgiveness of my sins. And I don't care what you've done. I don't care how low you've gotten. I don't care how bad things have gotten. There's nothing you've done. I don't care. There's nothing you've done that if you would repent of it, God can't forgive you or won't forgive you. He wants to forgive you. Amen? But you have to ask. Humble your heart and ask. If that's you today, it'd be my privilege and my honor as we come to the close of this service to just lead you in a prayer. 
of asking God to forgive you and to come into your life and to come into your heart. I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and to close their eyes. And if that's you today, say something like this from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you today. And I acknowledge my need for you. I ask you to forgive me, to come into my life, to come into my heart. From this day forward, I declare that I believe in you. I believe in what you did on the cross for me. I receive it. And I'm a follower of you. Thank you for dying. Three days later, rising from the grave and taking your place at the right hand of the Father. And because you live, I will live as well. And we're going to be head bowed and every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer with me for the first time, never having prayed to receive Christ before, just lift up your hands and say, Pastor Rick, I prayed with you today. I pray with you. I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand in the back as well. And if you're listening online, God sees your hand. That's the most important. If you pray that prayer as a recommitment today, slip up your hand. I see your hand. Hands going up all over the place. That's awesome. You can put your hands down. That's awesome. God is doing a great thing. He's doing a great thing in your lives. Today is not the end. It's the beginning of a long and lasting and loving relationship. God wants your, he wants things to get better in every area of your life. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I've come that you might have life and that life to the fullest. And so that's what happened today, the beginning of that process. So Father, I ask you to bless those hands that went up today. I pray, Father, that you would continue to do a work of grace in their lives, that you would mend our brokenness, that, Father, that, that you would straighten out uh, our crooked paths, that they can place their trust completely in you. A special blessing on them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.